the current treatment of Ebola is supportive because we still haven't got a specific treatment. Uh, and the most important element, people would agree, is the uh, fluid management. So the avoidance and treatment of, of dehydration is of crucial importance. And oral rehydration goes a long way, particularly if you combine it with symptomatic treatment of diarrhea and vomiting. But there still there will be some patients who just cannot drink enough. And then you need to think about ways how to give, uh, for instance, IV fluids or fluids in another than the oral way. There is also subcutaneous infusion, intraosseous infusion, but IV would be the, the second choice. Now that's sometimes difficult because um, you need to have enough staff to do that and you need to have well-trained staff and the right material. And there have certainly been moments where the providers were simply overwhelmed by the number of patients requiring this kind of care and have then been reluctant to give IV fluids. There are challenges with intravenous hydration and at the moment we are looking at the best ways to address those. There are several challenges. One is that in the early stages of disease, there's a feeling that people, if given really good support to drink, and if they've got adequate control of symptoms, so we make sure that any abdominal pain they have is controlled, any nausea they have is controlled, that early intake of appropriate oral rehydration uh, solution, maybe up to two to three liters a day, will, will be uh, of a significant benefit and may match the, the benefit that would be achieved with intravenous hydration. There are challenges with that, as we've discussed. It's very time consuming. It's quite laborious for the, the medical and nursing staff to spend significant time with people encouraging them and coaching them to drink. Um, in holding centres, there are problems giving intravenous hydration because there are people with Ebola and there are people with aren't Ebola. And in people who are confused, who are not very mobile, who may be prone to falling off beds uh, and, and pulling out, IV lines either unintentionally or intentionally when they're confused, uh, there is serious concerns about staff safety and about the safety of other patients. So people tend to be thrombocytopenic, their platelets tend to be low, they tend to bleed quite a lot and it takes a lot of pressure to, st to stop the bleeding. And we've seen cases whereby patients have pulled out inadvertently or, or intentionally intravenous lines and have bled profusely all over the, uh, the floor. That's got staff safety issues, it's got because the staff have to clean it up, the staff are potentially uh, able to slip on, 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 on blood spills. Uh, it's got patient cross-contamination issues if you've got someone who's likely to have Ebola next to someone who may well not. In terms of how we measure the, the progression of disease and in terms of measure how we uh, target therapy in West Africa, in Sierra Leone, compared to what we do in the UK, uh, it's, it's very challenging. There are no routine blood tests available anywhere in Sierra Leone, so for everyone getting intravenous therapy, we have no idea what electrolyte disturbances they have. People are dying quite regularly and dying quite suddenly. We assume that that's likely from electrolyte disturbance. Another challenge is that over the scale of the outbreak, the lessons from earlier outbreaks are not forgotten. Because uh, an isolation unit n does not only have to be technically correct, it also has to be acceptable. So that uh, the community come forward with their cases and allow hospitalization. And there have been at least uh, in the last place where I've been, Monrovian, Liberia, I think several shortcomings in this respect. So there have been several incidences where a patient has been taken away by the ambulance, but the family has not been informed where the patient was hospitalized, so they wouldn't know where he or she is staying then there was no facility for the relatives to visit the patients. In earlier outbreaks that was always uh, possible. I mean that was one of the lessons learned that you need to be transparent in your isolation ward. People need to be able to see that patients are well cared for, that they receive treatment and food, something to drink, that it is a real hospital. If you don't do that, if it's a closed unit, then people will believe all sorts of rumors up to the point that people may think patients are actively killed there and not treated. So not providing any possibility to visit patients is certainly not the best way of doing it. What can be done to maintain the contact between the, the patient, the isolated patient and the family? Uh, several things. I mean the minimum I think is that 
you provide a space where at least the patients who can walk can go to in their convalescent phase and then meet other family members at a distance. So most isolation wards are surrounded by a fence. So the patient would sit comfortably in the shade uh, on one side of the fence and the family would sit on the other side of the fence and they can talk to each other. I think that's the minimum and there is no reason why you would not provide that. It doesn't cost much, easy to organize, safe, it's just a lack of awareness if that is not provided. Another thing you can do is to provide mobile phones so that people can um, can telephone their, uh, can make phone calls to their families. That's certainly in an urban setting, also easy to organize, not very expensive, no, no reason why not providing that. Slightly more sophisticated is actually allowing a family member into the ward. Has been done successfully in early outbreaks, nothing ever happened, but of course that requires more human resources. You need to make sure that that family member dresses appropriately, you perhaps also want to supervise a bit the visit. But that's the only way how really a severely ill Ebola patient can see a family member and uh, be, in, be encouraged by the family member and also where the family can see that in this severe situation the patient receives care. So it's, it's a lot about uh, maintaining this contact is part of the supportive care for the patient, but it's also transparency and confidence building with the community. That's why it's so important. What matters most for the acceptability of the treatment is that people see the effort. So if they see that drugs are given to the patient, if they see that fluids, IV fluids, IV liquids are given to the patient, that is what they will appreciate and they see the effort uh, of the health staff towards their loved ones. Of course, if we had a new drug which reduces case fatality really drastically from, let's say, 70% to 10%, so that most of the patients, the vast majority, survives, that would change the perception. But a modest decrease of the case fatality and that is perhaps what we are more likely to see from 70 to 50 percent will not necessarily change the perception of the isolation or there these measures to increase transparency to be seen to make an effort that's the more important thing then